it sounds it sounds pretty good. Are you can is my voice coming through your earphones? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> he started straight in there. Straight in there. <laughs> start start as they mean to go as you mean to go on, as they say. Fucking hell. Well, anyway, Adrian, um, so you, so you're all good to go now. You, you comfortable? Do you have coffee and all that stuff? No, I haven't had coffee. I don't have a chance to have coffee. Do you want it? You could get coffee if you want. There's no, no rush. I haven't. I've got seventy percent of our AirPad play. Okay. Seventy-one percent. So that okay. means in ten minutes it'll finish. <laughs> <laughs> we got to look. Last for long. Well, we've got well, we've got a lot to get through. Or you you could just yeah. be like Pierre as well, and he just fucking ripped them out and spoke straight into the laptop, and people didn't really care because his 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 message was so powerful and profound. Yeah, well, you won't be getting any of that from me. So, what am I going to be getting? What do you want? How? Where do you want me to position this thing? No, it's perfect. It's perfect. Me. No, it's like perfect. Really- it's like a cool. Um, is that so? How do you want me to sit? Kind of. Uh, no, it's per- it's perfect. Like you, just be comfortable. I mean, like you, you, I just need you to be in this. <laughs> I just need you to be in the center of the screen, like you are now. If you're good, then mm. then I'm good. It's all good. Oh yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Don't even know. Okay. Yeah. All good. So listen, let's um, we we kind of do this rolling start where there isn't like a formal. Like five, four, three, two, one. So we're going. Yeah, no, it's, just... <laughs> it's a bit weird. But I don't know. Is it? Just start talking about you stuff, don't. Yeah. Li- well, you don't listen to podcasts. That's probably why. But a lot of podcasts do that, and I oh, kind of like that. The podcast. Well, you're probably Please too busy keep this for this page as well. open. You can still hang up or reload. Don't do that's that yet. Nice don't option. do that yet. <laughs> I'm tempted already. <laughs> Jesus. Adrian, anyway. I, I, I know you're a busy guy. I'm really, really grateful for you doing this. And I'm sure mm. a lot of people, well, there are a lot of people that are really interested to hear this as well, despite what you think. So thank you very much for doing this. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, listen, let's, we've, we've obviously only got a limited amount of time. Let's start right at the beginning where you grew up and how you became a motorcycle designer. Um, okay, so... Uh I was born in Norwich in England, famous only for chickens, poultry, and uh, lotus. And basically, to be honest, at school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I didn't really have an ambition to become a designer of particularly motorcycles, but uh, certainly the only thing I was good at at school really was kind of more artistic. I was really interested in technology. And I, I genuinely didn't know what I, I could, how I could apply this to a career. So um, it was, I suppose there is some degree of destiny in some people's lives. I think in, in my case, it's certainly the case. Uh, I picked up a newspaper, which I never did. And I was just flicking through this newspaper, local newspaper. And it just, I don't know, it was, it was very bizarre. <laughs> it is a bit, it is a bit strange. It's too strange to be true, really. But uh, anyway, I just was looking through this newspaper that I never would genuinely pick up. And there was a little, very small uh, mention of um, a, a conference or like a, a talk, if you like, at the local college uh, with Peter Stevens, who at that point was working in Lotus Cars. And he was just basically going to speak about, you know, it was a mention of his uh, talking about his career, basically. And so I took my push bike for some bizarre reason. I decided that would be quite an interesting thing to to, to, to listen to because I didn't even really know what a designer was. I know it sounds kind of bizarre. Sorry, how, you know? how old are you here? <clears throat> I was doing my A-levels. Okay, so this and is what, 16 so or? I was about sort of 17, 18, I suppose, at that time. Okay. And... Basically, took my push bike, went down to the city centre, walked into this uh, the city college I'd never been into before, and sat down and was kind of a, a bit overwhelmed with what this guy was doing. You know, he was basically designing trucks and cars, and you know, it was like, wow. You know, <laughs> it sounds like today I've heard this mentioned before. You know, kind of my era of designer is you know wasn't. Uh, immersed in a world of uh, pin interest and Instagram and, you know, likes and dislikes. It was, you know, it was very much, uh, you had to really search for it 
to become a designer in a way. You really had to almost, it was just, I think a lot of people probably ended up in the design industry like myself, kind of almost through luck or maybe just because they got, had contact with somebody that sort of explained that there exists this role as a, a, you know, this job exists as a designer to be creative and to apply that into a, an industrial context and actually create something from, from nothing, really. So, you know, it, it's fairly obvious, you know, you've been in the design world and we all, you know, I've seen obviously many years in the design world now, but it's not that clear as when you're at school that exists this, how you, you know, you can have something, you can have creativity and you can apply it to something in terms of a job, you know, because I, I remember actually being quite good at graphics and sketching and, and, and art, if you like, at school. I was looking for a job in Norwich and I was trying to desperately find something to do to apply this. And I was like going to printing firms because I didn't really know how, you know, how I could actually apply this, this knowledge or this, this desire to do something creative in a context of a, of a part of the country that really had no industry uh, apart from Lotus. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously if you lived in Coventry, you probably have a slightly more, un you know, more understanding of the, the automotive industry because it's part of the culture and, you know, you probably know somebody who works at Rover or whatever, but, you know, in Norwich, it wasn't really the cult, you know, you either became a chicken factory operative or uh, an insurance broker, you know, which is the two biggest interest industries within that area of, of England. So, you know, and most of the, most of the people at school, you know, they where the ambition was to work at Norwich Union, which was, you know, I didn't feel that was very appropriate for, for myself. But anyway, to cut a long story short, which I'm not, um, <laughs> to get back to, to, to basically this, uh, this discussion from uh, Peter Stevens, it was, I just found it absolutely incredible that this guy like sat down, sketched an object, you know, in this case, like a Leyland truck was one of the things I remember distinctly. And ironically, I ended up actually doing a stage in a uh, placement in uh, Ogle where they did some work on that Leyland truck. But anyway, so, you know, I just found it quite interesting, this guy's career. And, and at the time, all my friends at school were into motorcycles. And that's, <laughs> you know, that was another, that was the, that was the, you know, I had these aspirations, you know, to own a motorcycle like most of my friends, but ended up having some terribly inefficient, unreliable 20 pounds worth of motorcycle that I owned. And uh, anyway, to cut a long story short, I kind of was interested in this thing about design. I didn't really know much about how I'd get into this world, but I started looking at courses and what have you. And I had this passion for the motorcycles that came out of my, you know, my school friends, you know, basically we all had motorcycles and mine was the worst technically and, and, and visually, but, uh, you know, I suppose it. I kind of combined these two two aspects together and realised that there was a course in Coventry that, that did transport design. So that was all, you know, kind of very, very um, detached from my everyday world. You know, being at school uh, was, uh, you know, it's, there's no, you can't prepare yourself enough really to go to university. And I, I was completely... Out of my out of my depth, really, because I didn't know what I was going to, you know, how what this thing would be like. You know, university was it going to be like? How, how am I going to fit into that environment? Will I will I be able to get in there? Kind of thing. You know, I was so distant from that the world of uh, of actually trying to turn it into a career that you know it was just I don't know. It was it was pretty. It was very it's very difficult to explain. I think because today is so easy to find everything on the internet. Whereas when you're, you know, isolated in many senses, not just from the, the technological viewpoint, but also in terms of the culture of, of not Norfolk and Norwich, it's, it's very, it's hard to believe really that I've managed to, to, to kind of get into what I'm doing today, really. So it is a, there is a bit of destiny in there. And if I wouldn't have picked up the newspaper, I wouldn't have known about Peter Stevens, and I certainly wouldn't know about the world of uh, designing things, which sounds a bit crazy but it, did, it's not did that you get easy. to speak to him at that did you get to speak to him at that talk no, no no i just remember i remember walking out of the 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 talk and i was i i looked at all the there was quite a lot of people actually present it was quite strange and i and i, and I remember thinking i wonder how many people in this group of people here will end up actually being designers after this you know it kind of made me think you know kind of reflect to myself you know is there 
is there anybody in this room who came out of this room today who's actually going to end up being the designer? And I thought, well, you know, maybe that that could be a, a career for myself. You know, maybe, you know, and as I say, I started looking at, you know, I went to a, a, a kind of uh, careers office and uh, and basically I saw there was this course at Coventry. So my parents took me to this the, the interview for this course and again, I was completely out of my depth. I didn't have any understanding about this. You know, what, what, what actually meant to go to university in the context of a design course. It was completely alien. You know, doing artwork at school is, is very much detached from a four-year course in, in industrial design transportation. So, um, and obviously when I arrived there, you know, I, I was one of the, you know, there was very few people in my position, there was a lot of people who did have a bit of an understanding of what they're actually getting into. And there were some incredibly talented people who were right there from the beginning, you know, the first day kind of thing. So, you know, it was a, a steep learning curve, shall we say. So you had no idea how competitive it was, for example? <laughs> uh, no, absolutely no. No idea, really. Jesus. No idea. So, so, Adrian, did you go there yeah, with a the, like, strip? too. <laughs> did you did you did you go there with a strict intention to um, focus on motorcycles, like tailor make the course for yourself almost? Um, I don't think I don't think it was quite like that. I think it was more a case of uh, uh, I suppose I think I th there was some some really good guys in there from day one, kind of thing, you know. Um, a guy who became a really good friend of mine. Uh, was a, I, I think probably the most talented car designer I've seen in my career, at least. You know, in terms of creativity, uh, you know, he was sketching better in the first days than I was after four years. You know, so Stuart Jameson, who was a, a really, I think, a really top guy and a, and a really good designer, was a huge inspiration for me from day one because I, I looked over. To see what he was sketching and it was like <laughs> an a2 you know rendering of a, a front three quarter of a car you know and he worked he had a quick placement at ford so he knew all about what car design was about and i i suppose i felt a bit out of depth to do car design because i wasn't really a pa you know a passionate car kind of guy and i and i really kind of almost preferred kind of more the technical side rather than the styling side in a way you know, in, in some respects, because my schooling was more aligned to, you know, I was good at technology, whatever that was, what that, what that meant at the time. And, and it was a quite a distant, you know, I'm not, you know, it was very, very distant, uh, the school to university, you know, being immersed in, in, a, in a completely different world and with completely different criteria and, and talent, a lot of talent, you know, people who could really sketch really well and people who were kind of born to become designers, should we say. I didn't, I wasn't born to become a designer, I don't think. I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty uh, sure of that. I, I think I worked really hard, but I wasn't necessarily the best artist or I'm certainly not the best artist. And I'm certainly not the best designer, I don't think, out there. But uh, I really did put a lot of effort into the, my entire uh, career and also into my schooling. So I kind of try to fill in the gaps in a way, in some respects, to make up for this, you know, I wasn't born with a natural talent, shall we say. So... Did you show an aptitude for art at all at school? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, there's art and there's, <laughs> there's you know, people born to do art. You know, I was good at art, but in the context of a school, which is a far cry from guys who are, you know, dreaming about being car designers from seven years old or whatever, you know. You, you, you know, some of the interviews you've done, you know, there's people who like, I don't know, their parents are designers or artists, you know. Yes. My parents were, weren't artists or designers. Um, my, my father drove a lorry for a living. So, you know, it's a, a, again, a, from a cultural viewpoint, I didn't have perhaps the same, uh, some of the same characteristics of some of the people on my course, if you see what I mean. So yes. anyway, okay. Well, I'm, I'm actually it's quite a bit, of a, a bit emotional actually talking about this stuff. I don't know why. No, that no, it should be though. 
Oh, it's good. It's, yeah, it is a bit weird. Anyway. So anyway, basically, the, um, yeah, so I turned up at Coventry and, and as I say, the level of the quality of the, of the people and the, the, you know, the thinking and the, the desire, if you like, to become a designer was very evident. And in myself, I would think um, I kind of had to learn that a little bit as well. I didn't feel that I had the same... I had a lot of... Uh, it was all new to me, far too new. You know, there was nothing... I'd never seen really sketches of cars, <laughs> if that makes any sense, to the level that I'd seen in the first day kind of thing. You know, so the only thing that you'd seen was a presentation of, of Peter Stevens yeah, at that point? Yeah. Wow. So that's incredible. So you, so you got there and, pro, and, and obviously felt quite out of, out of your depth. Absolutely. Yeah. Completely. <laughs> yeah. So what, Adrian, what did you, what, what did you do to, to improve? I mean, without stating the obvious, obviously you practice, but I mean, you know, it, you obviously got a lot better because you ended up going to the RCA in the end. Yeah. But, um, like, I wonder, like, what did you, like did you were you just very good at balancing like party and discipline or did you knuckle down and Hi, draw I every day <laughs> i was really i worked really hard i worked really really hard uh and uh i was very lucky and i was in a house with uh a guy called niall hamilton who's probably one of the best uh 3d modelers that i've ever met and has worked with me as occasionally when i was in mv and uh was a really good friend and, and he was in the same house as myself and he had a very determined drive. And the other guy who was in the house with me was Stuart Jameson, who I mentioned previously. And really, I mean, having those two guys was a real, you know, really made the difference, I think. Because if I'd have been with other people, I think I'd have probably been less focused because these guys were really good. You know, they were like good from day one. You know, but Niall Hamilton was a, was uh, did illustrations in in, in motorcycle magazines. Uh, did an amazing, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. You know, he had a really good uh, ability, and Stuart Jameson had a very very good ability to to sketch. He was probably the best. You know, some people are like, like born artists. I wasn't at all yeah. a born artist. Artist. So having people around you that are really good it sets sets your goalposts a bit higher for sure. And I was, you know, I was pretty determined to do well as well. My parents, you know, got in debt for me to go to university and also RCA. So, you know, it's kind of uh, for respect for what they offered me in a way. I, I did put a lot of work in. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I, so so that whole notion of like, you know, show me your friends and I'll show you who you are sort of thing. I mean, that, that, that very much applied to your time at Coventry specifically. And I think, mm. you know, when you talk about destiny, that's a... It it sounds like everything up until that point just really um, the circumstances were really good. I mean, obviously you put in the work, but you know you could have ended up in a room with any well in a house with anybody. Yeah, I mean those that's that's pretty that's pretty incredible. How mm. many people were in 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 your year at that time, Adrian? Do you Oof. remember? Uh, I don't remember the exact number. I remember RCA. But I mean, are we talking like less. 50 or... <laughs> no, no. I'm are we talking like 50? A lot, a lot less. less. I think about 25, 27, something like that. The numbers wow. went up exponentially after I left, I think. Same with RCA. It's, it was insane. Mm. I mean, I, I, I think like I... I mean, when I, I studied there in uh, 2005, I started and we mm. they had already like well surpassed... Only 10 years after more me. More like... <laughs> <laughs> 150 well when did you did, were you you were there in 95 yeah um, I think no I started RCA in 95 I think yeah is that right so Adrian tell me tell me about um, the application process for the RCA like what point did you decide okay I I should probably go on and do this other thing um, I don't know that was a, another bizarre kind of I suppose I, I think um, I suppose I built a, a degree of confidence with my own ability. You know, by the end of Coventry, I'd kind of got to a level that was probably a, more than my expectations. And uh, I don't know. I suppose the RCA was a, almost like a guarantee in a way to get something more out of the career. And you know, I was so lucky to get in there because. 
you know, on a purely artistic level, I don't think I was, you know, there's some really, really talented guys who've gone through RCA and to be honest, you know, especially then, you know, especially then there was 11 people or whatever. So to get into there, uh, was, um, I don't know. Uh, they obviously felt that there was something in me that I could, could, uh, could develop for sure because they you know the RCA is not just about the best people in the world you know going through the best school in the world as it was at the time probably uh, in the terms that there wasn't many other courses that offered that level so but uh, I think it was more of a case of what they saw in you as an individual to develop in that in that two years and you know I think I I did that you know over the two years I, I think I you know I worked very very hard in RCA and and I did a pretty incredible project in terms of the complexity of, you know, I did a full-size motorcycle and a set of levers that was a pretty big undertaking as an individual. And I got incredible amount of help from, particular, in particular, Ken Greenlee and, and uh, Les Allen, who was who's a model maker there, well, a, a tutor, but a really good model maker. And... Uh, you know, to, and Ken Green, as I say, was, you know, I, I wasn't sponsored. So my parents had to get in debt to go there. So again, I felt <laughs> I had to do my best job, you know, in a way. So, um, yeah, so Ken Greenlee really, really helped me out financially and, uh, and also um, in terms of the assistance to do the project. So... You know, basically, I, I did a full-size clay of a motorcycle and I got shipped off to, to the middle of uh, Letchworth, Hitchin or whatever, uh, to work with with some really some really cool guys called uh, Gordon... I did write these down because I think it's important these people are mentioned in a way. <laughs> Gordon Maddy, <laughs> who's, a, who's, a, who's actually became a model maker at RCA afterwards. And uh... take, take your time, Adrian. No, I just wanted to say that, you know, our industry specifically, I mean, at least in car design, um, not that it's possible to always credit everybody, but there's so much of, um, you know, like rock star guys getting up and going like, I fucking did this. No, and, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it was like a, a single a single man operation it, it, it's you know, a, and he's so it's a bit weird for me because it's quite emotional because it, you know it, it's a bit weird because it feels like um as i say i wouldn't have been able to do it without these guys really <laughs> didn't think it would go quite I, like this this evening <laughs> to be honest that, but it's a bit well you were weird. hoping to abuse me i thought you were going to be i thought you were i thought be it was well, but i guess but i genuinely well. <laughs> feel a bit different about the whole thing talking about it is it's quite well, the, it's quite heavy actually it's a bit bizarre because it wasn't I, like, it, it like is. i feel really like uh you know talking about my uh like my parents and that they went in debt for me to go to rca you know <laughs> so all that stuff sort of I, has a different you know when you when you listen to these guys who've had their swanky uh, deals with uh, Audi to, to go to sponsor, you know, for sponsorship and what have you, it, it puts it a little bit more into context when you have to get in debt to go there kind of thing. <laughs> I, I, I totally, and I, you know, I, I, um, I had a similar experience the other day. I was speaking to an old friend who's, um, I actually lived with them when I first got to England for a while. I mean, it was more like, it, it was supposed to be temporary and I ended up basically staying with him for three years. And mm. I just, I, I'd i been out of touch with him for a long time and I just kind of called them to reconnect and, and to try and say thank you. And I couldn't fucking, I couldn't get the words out of my mouth without completely choking up. Like it was, mm. so I, I understand, I understand the magnitude of it. And, and um, no, no, it's for, for sure. And it's like, I never really talked about it before in a, in a context, in this kind of context. So it feels a bit sort of weird. It's like, pouring out your life story a little bit is a bit weird anyway no, sorry I, I thought but, it'd be a bit more lightweight but it actually is, you know um I, i'll sort of sort of you know i could probably just key this it you can key this bit in again i mean as i say uh, the people like Green, ken greenley really gave me the opportunity to to do the best job i could they kind of I, I really worked hard to to do um this full-size motorcycle and, and levers as i said and uh you know, I basically he gave me the opportunity to be shipped off to to an industrial estate in Hitchin to work with these two guys, 
uh, Gordon Addy and um, Paul Tredinix. So these guys basically went out of their way to get my project finished. And I was literally sleeping in, in, these, uh, in this industrial wear workshop, which was covered in dust. And, and I was sleeping like literally in, in fiberglass sh sheets <laughs> occasionally to stay there the night. I was doing like Jesus. an average of like 18 hours a day kind of thing, 17, 18 hours a day, every day. And it was like a real, and these guys were coming in the morning. I would like sort of be there hacking away at this fiberglass mold. The mo I remember the fiberglass mold stuck into the mold. You know, the fiberglass piece, the final piece of the bike, we were literally ripping it out of the mold because it was stuck into the mold. And it was like, <laughs> it was just crazy. But those guys really, you know, Ken Greeny gave me the opportunity to go there and they, they, they covered some of the, the costs to, go, to, to use this company externally. And these guys were just like really just amazing. They, they helped me out so much to do that project and I'll never be able to repay them for what they offered, you know, what they gave me. I mean, they were paid to do it, if you like, but, you know, they went beyond just, you know, became a lot more than just a, a, a normal job in a way. And uh, it was such a lot of work. And, um, you know, it was, I remember, you know, Les Dallin, the guy, one of the tutors, absolutely amazing guy, really nice guy. And... Uh, he came out and, and kind of modelled in. I had like this binnacle at the top and it had to be modelled in the inside surfaces in the clay, if you see what I mean. So it was all done in, in you know, yeah. full size in clay and it had to be remodelled. And like in an afternoon, he modelled in all these you know, inner surfaces of the clay. That had to, you know, so I had the outside surface done of the clay that there was the mould was taken off it. And he modelled up the entire inside of the surface to take another mould off it to make the internal part. And it was like, Jesus. you know, stuff like this, it's like it goes beyond... You know, that stuff there, you, you remember always when people help you out in your life, you know, that level. You know, if I wouldn't have done a really good project at that, uh, you know, universe, uh, RCA, you know, I, I came out of RCA, I won the Triplex Award that year for the best student. And I got a job offer the day before the show, two job offers. It actually, it was quite bizarre. Fuck, you know, you know it's like uh, I was I was literally... Absolutely covered in shit, putting it bluntly. <laughs> it was absolutely disgusting. I, I rolled this bike in, finished, into the RCA the day before the show. And I had to dress this mannequin. This mannequin was far too big for the levers I had made. So I literally had to hack him <laughs> into pieces. <laughs> Quite literally, I had to like cut a bit off him in the middle to get the levers on him. And I, was, I remember distinctly clambering on, around on the floor in the RCA with this set of levers I had to dress onto this mannequin and I had David Robb or Dave Robb from BMW design motorcycle design uh, chief designer of BMW and Pieta Blanche who was at that point working for Ducati on either side of me while I was like <laughs> clambering around on the floor basically uh, with this with these absolutely filthy jeans t-shirt and uh Completely disgusting. I, I don't think I had a wash about three or four days, probably. Actually, I remember. I remember. I was still. I was still bleeding from the from my last critique at RCA. I had the. I had the crit. I had the crit with um, at RCA, and I took a video. I remember taking a video of this uh, of the bike. You know, like filming it from below with like VHS kind of video. <laughs> and my, basically, I. I the day before I went to the to the RCA, I did a burnout of this this old bike that actually that was another story. It's a story within a story. But the guy, from the security guard from the RCA, gave me a motorcycle. That's how cool some people are in life, you know. They actually gave, what? He felt sorry for me, and he gave me a motorcycle. He basically gave me an old uh, Ben, you know, his old two hundred cc motorcycle. Called a guy called Tim, who was a security guard at the RCA, he used to let me stay in there late. And he basically gave me this motorcycle. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I did a burnout <laughs> for some bizarre reason. And I completely flattened off the, off the back of the tyre. I think it was probably because I was finishing the project. I, I don't know. What, the moment of madness. Anyway, to cut a long story short, the tyre was completely scared off anyway. And I was going to RCA in London from Hitchin. And I crashed on the, on the roundabout. And I was like, walk, I walked into my crit critique with like all my legs bleeding completely. And I just put the video in the cassette. <laughs> And it was like uh, dropped down, and basically said, "This is the bike." <laughs> That's it. 
<laughs> that was my critique. Basically, I showed him the showed him the bike on a, on a dodgy video, you know, like a VHS video that was all kind of a bit odd. And um, and that was my critique for the for my project at RCA. Completely, you know, while I was just bleeding to death in front of them. So yeah, Jesus. Anyway, so that was yeah, but uh, that was that kind of I was. You know, as I say, I think I was really lucky to to have people to help me out, and you know, to have a guy to give you a motorcycle when you're at college, as you know, it's infinite value. You know, it's not really the value of the bike that really matters. It's just the fact that somebody's willing to do that. You know, and as I say, you know, get tutors that make you know really get, make the difference. It wasn't just you know, Ken Green was a really nice guy, but I, you know, the fact he actually believed in me that much to to help me out to get that project finished at to a really high level was like beyond what I could have hoped for, really. And uh, as I say, it's, you know, you really, I, you know, I think uh, when you meet people like that in your life, it really makes a difference, especially when you're not in perhaps the best position in terms of financially or you haven't got a placement yeah. or, a, or a, you know, haven't got um, sponsorship from a company. All those things have a lot more weight to them than, you know, an average student's going through their completely paid and, 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 uh, with kind of a, a monthly kind of salary, if you like, in some respects. So, yeah. Yeah. As a side. <laughs> I, I know all too well about that. Yeah. 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 But, it, but it probably made me a little bit stronger, all that stuff as well. You know, I think I became a lot more determined, you know, after, after that, because of all that stuff. You know, really. But it also makes you value, it also makes you value things when, when it happens. Yeah, I think it makes you value people as well. I think you have a different, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, I had a lot of other issues, you know, on the negative side of, of relationships within work and what have you. But uh, I think uh, when you meet people who really go out of their way to help you, it makes a big difference, especially when you're, when you're in a slightly, you know, slightly yeah, difficult situation, shall we say, and you haven't got the in infinite budget, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> Adrian, what, um, when you, by the time you were at the RCA, were you aware of some of the, you know, the big names in in um, in bike design? I mean, like you mentioned, Pierre, but also people like um, Massimo Tamburini, who you went to work for originally. Uh, eventually, yeah. Did you did you know about these people already? Yeah, I mean, actually, I, the the guy I knew. And more than anybody, really, was a guy called Glenn Kerr, who was uh, quite a famous. He did a lot of illustrations in magazines and stuff for motorcycles. And I remember driving to Wales in the last year of Coventry, and the you know to look at my work, I was really you know super, you know I really admired his his ability and stuff as a motorcycle designer. And you know he did he did work for Yamaha, and uh, he was a you know freelancing and doing what have you. He was a you know very he's a very talented designer. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I went to his house and I showed him my portfolio. And the last thing he said to me when I walked out the door was, well, you'll never be a motorcycle designer. <laughs> so, Is that what he said? Yeah, that's what he said. So Jesus. it's really the best thing that happened to me that day. Because I think it, then, it, then it became like, I'm on a mission now to, to become a motorcycle designer. <laughs> you definitely need something to tell you that you can't do something in life to make you much more determined to do it. That's for sure. Had you, and, and you had already got your place at the RCA at this point? Um, no, that was at Coventry. That was the third year of Coventry, so I had still one year to go. And, and I that had, just put fuel on the fire and you just doubled down on, yeah, on what you were already doing? I had a particularly bad third year because I was living in a terrible house in, in the third year of Coventry. And uh, it was a particularly bad year as a whole. So I had everything to prove in the final year of RCA kind of thing. Uh, of us, yeah, of Coventry, should I say. And, uh, you know, and having that as well kind of just added a bit more stimulus, shall we say, to, to, to do, to do go beyond what I really thought I could do. So I had a really, as I say, I had a very difficult third year of Coventry. It was particularly bad for me and uh, for various reasons regarding the school and the course and everything. It was, it was a very difficult year to get through. And I had everything to prove in the final year. And I've just been told that I'd never become a motorcycle designer. <laughs> Where by this point, obviously, I wanted to be a motorcycle designer. So I really had to 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 uh, push out the boat, shall we say. I was lucky in a way. I had a placement at Ogle Design and I met um, 
a guy called Nick Tolbert who worked at, he was, you know, he really gave me a bit of encouragement and certainly put me a little bit back on track and stuff. And he'd, he'd worked in the motorcycle world. He'd worked at Seymour Powell for a while. So, I mean, you know, I kind of had a bit of hope that I could do something better in the final year. So I really, as I say, I worked really hard and that's, that's the result is I got to the RCA afterwards and then from the RCA, as I say, back to where I was in the conversation 10 minutes ago, basically I was, I had Pierre to Blanche and, and uh, Dave Robb offering me a job even before the, the show opened. And that was like, yeah, but I've got this to do. So I don't want to talk about that at the moment. <laughs> you know, I was far too focused on getting that bike finished and presented. And I didn't really care about getting a job really at that point. In some respects, you know. Oh, I was did so, you not? Were you no, just detached? I, in a sense, it, I was. Yeah. I was so focused on getting that, you know, the, the yes. levers on the on the on the on the mannequin and getting the bike yes. presented. That, to be honest, the the opportunity to have a job was almost like irrelevant, really, at that point. In some respects, it's fucking outrageous. This the mental state that you can get yourself into in these. Yeah, moments. I was really focused. I mean, I was working so many hours a day to get that bike finished. I mean, it wasn't an easy ride shall we say to do a full-size bike and it wasn't you know i worked with a company called frank thomas who did the levers with me but i had all these panels all over it you know i did like it was basically uh, i did a, a bike uh, you know associated with armor you know a suit of armor if you imagine a, a guy on a on a horseback in the medieval times i kind of assimilated that to a motorcycle because you know like a motorcycle is an object with a person on it and then it's very much yes. a graphical thing the the guy with the levers on so I wanted to go a little bit beyond that and do something where it became something almost like one one kind of visual language between the rider and the motorcycle, which I still think is an interesting concept. And that has already been done in medieval times with a horse and a, and a knight on its back kind of thing. So I kind of used that as an inspiration. And it was a, I think it was a quite a cool idea to go beyond just a graphical connection. Adrian, do you remember any of the guys that were um, with you at the RCA at that time, like peers, contemporaries? There was some really good designers uh, at the RCA. And, you know, uh, obviously, one of the guys who who made, without question, the, the career that, you know, most probably the most enviable career is uh, Gordon Wagner, who was there, who was now head of Daimler, so... He did a really, wow. he was a really, yeah, a really nice guy as well. And like, you know, I, I knew he would be, get some, you know, do well within his life because he was pretty confident about what he was doing. But there's a, you know, there's some really good, uh, you know, uh, Steve Cridgens who worked at Lotus and now is at McLaren. Uh, Hugo, Hugo Nightingale, guy works at Jaguar. I know Hugo, yes. yeah. He's really, yeah, I mean, the world's quite small and, uh, you know, there was some, and then the guy, the head, of, the head of design for Audi, lighting, uh, Caesar Mutada. You know, there was a, there was some good, and then also the guy who's now head of, um, head of uh, Alfa Romeo. The, and, uh, ah, the Italian guy. Yeah, yeah. you told me. Alessandro. I, 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 his name is that Roma, Romanos Alessandro. No, I don't know. I wrote it down because I thought I'd mention him. But you know, people. I mean, there was a, you know, there's that's some of the people I can't really remember. But there's some, you know, pretty important names already in there. And obviously, RCA has got you know a wealth of people in the industry now who have really made the difference, kind of thing. So, but they, you know, that in, in you know within the two years I was there, that was the people, some of the people that I remember, and they were they were pretty good there. So, so it was obvious they were going to make a good career for themselves. Adrian, tell me about your uh, move to Italy. Oh, no, yeah. Um, well, basically, I mean, yeah. So I, so for the third time, I'm going back to having the two guys offering me a job. I, I, I really, obviously, I always look at it a bit like this, and I've said this many a time. You know, you, you, you make decisions with your heart or your head, kind of thing. And so, if you look at all the, you know, the financially uh, benefits learning a new language or the rest of it, it would be obvious to go to BMW. But if you're just like, I went to like a dealership to BMW and they weren't in the same position. They weren't in a, the same position they are today in terms of what the brand image was in some respects. And I went to gone to a Ducati dealership in London and I just looked at the bike and thought, you know, if I can have the opportunity to, to, to learn something from this guy, Massimo Tamburini, um, 
then it makes more sense, you know, and that's very much a, you know, it doesn't make any sense to go to Italy from a financial viewpoint, certainly. From a lifestyle viewpoint, maybe yes, but, you know, it was very, I was, I'd already decided that I want to go to Italy anyway. You know, I had the idea that Italy would be a great place to, to, to experience and, and um, you know, having the opportunity to work with Pierre as well. You know, it all didn't quite Can you- pan out as expected, shall we say. Because of, well, what, ha- what 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 happened? Can you tell me a little bit about those first days at? Uh, it was Kajiva that you went to first. Um, no, originally, yeah. I mean, the the company was in a in a sort of transitional phase in a way. It was like um, Ducati was being sold off at the time to TPG Group, the uh, American com- uh, group, and um, you yeah, know, MB Augusta was uh, was a brand that. The Castiglione family had, had purchased, but it wasn't being utilized at that time. And then the, the projects that we were working on it initially, the first project I worked on was a Gajiva 750 naked bike, which ended up being becoming the, 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 the MB Augusta Brutale. So, uh, that was the first project I worked on. But so, you know, basically I saw kind of MB Augusta reborn, um, you know, so that was a really interesting kind of experience to sort of be at the beginnings of this reborn company. And, you know, I contributed to, to some of that. I, I worked on the on the Brutale project. You know, I'm quite proud I even I gave the name to that, that to that motorcycle and the sketches and stuff. And oh, wow. uh, so it was quite you know, but then I then I left <laughs> because there was some some bizarre requests from a from a contractual viewpoint that I didn't agree with. That they wanted, you know, to non-disclosure agreement, but you know, many things went a bit after a year and a half of being there. And I, I kind of thought I'd invested six years of my life to become a designer, and I wasn't willing to sort of not work in the motorcycle industry for a non, you know, from a you know non-competitor uh, kind of contract. So I decided to leave rather than sign it, kind of thing, basically. And so I went just moved up to, you know, up the road to, to work in, in Benelli for, which is like a half an hour away from where I was living to work in San Marino previously. I'd, I'd moved company to, to, to Benelli Motorcycles, which was, um, had just been reborn as a, as a brand. It's, it's Italian's oldest brand as well. So I kind of worked, you know, I was kind of lucky. I'd, I'd just worked on an MV or the beginnings of, and I had to leave the project, which was terrible from a psychological viewpoint. But uh, I had the opportunity to uh, join um, Benelli, and it was an amazing experience to to look, to work in a company of fifty people, very small company. But I had a lot of freedom and a lot of trust. I was really lucky um, to to find the company owner was just gave me so much trust. Basically, you know, again, that was another very significant. You know, Andre Maloney, who was the owner of the company, uh, gave me an incredible amount of freedom to. To, to basically design the motorcycles for Benelli, which was like incredible, really. When you think about, I just literally come out of university, uh, straight out of RCA, spent a year and a half in, in you know, experience and my first sort of glimpse of what it's like to work in industry. And then I was put in the deep end to go to, to design, you know, a, a, a sports bike for, for Benelli. And basically he said, you know, uh, I'd just spoken to Pierre. Well, Pierre uh, had divided away from from M, from M, from the group, and then became part, you know, design director of Ducati. But I remained a friend of his, and basically just come back from England, saying, you know, I've just done this project in England with new technology, alias, blah blah. He talked about it on his uh, conversation, and basically I decided that it sounds like a great idea to do it, you know, using new technology and you know, really fast turnover and, and accelerate the process. It was like three months to do the bike. So I didn't have a very many options really because I didn't have a structure inside the company. And I and I did the same thing. I went, I moved to, you know, basically spent three and a half months in England working with this company called AKA. And I did the first, you know, real bike of my career basically, which was the Tornado, which was like a, you know, hyper bike, sports bike with, fans <laughs> in the back which is yeah it was a super uh, cool experience and then I you know Benelli was really 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 cool 
you know it was a amazing experience really yeah, and, it's, and it, again because of the trust and, and the the human factor was super important how many people within the, those 50 people how many people made up design one one wow me Fucking <laughs> hell. yeah exactly so what did you you must have learned a hell of a lot in terms of um i mean over and above design stuff but um you know project management and huh? time management <laughs> and all, uh, no yeah. or was it just like get this done as as quickly I, I, as I possible was, i was super lucky the guys in in the aka company were really really cool again the the human factor is always you can't you know you never do anything on your own in life and and they did a really amazing job and I, you know, okay, I oversaw all the stuff and, you know, worked as hard as everybody else did in there and stuff to get the job done. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not a project manager and I'm not a, but I, I really love what I do. And I think that energy, even more so today in some respects, you know, the people I work with today, I've got more energy probably now in terms of getting some excitement around the project and stuff than I ever have, to, you know, in, you know, because that is a, a skill, you know, as important as being a good designer. If you get other people on board with that kind of emotive aspect, I think it really, really adds a lot to the project. There's something that goes beyond just doing the job, you know. It is a very personal thing, design, but I think you can kind of transmit an energy around a project that, that gives it something extra sometimes. You know, it doesn't always happen, obviously, but, you know, in the right context, it, in the right people, it, it really does make a difference. Adrian, can you tell me a little bit about um, uh, Massimo Tamburini? I mean, I, 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 that <laughs> must have, like, was yeah. it, what was it like meeting him for the first time? Were you, I was were a bit, you daunted by that at all? Absolute, or? Absolutely. I mean, the guys, you know, but, you know, I was overwhelmed to have the opportunity to work for such a, you know, like, you know, uh, important, you know, he was already super important in terms of his, um, you know, uh, list of projects and you know he was he transformed in some respects the 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 importance of design within motorcycles you know I think uh, you know the, he set certain benchmarks and certain criteria that certainly influenced my career very heavily because I had to live up to some, you know later uh, I had to live up to his levels which were completely under different uh, time constraints and resource constraints and what have you but he set very high benchmarks and he had a you know he was a very talented guy you know unfortunately from uh you know I really hope to 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 learn something from him but somebody like Tamburini is uh isn't somebody who sits down and teaches you how to do things you just like Pierre said exactly the same thing you know, that in a way, I had a very conflictual re relationship with him, I think. And I think Pierre did as well, in some respects. I think there was yeah, a degree of... Yeah, I think he did as well. Yeah. yeah. But um, I think if I was less talented and less driven, I probably wouldn't have the conflicts, if that makes any sense. Again, oh, like you would Pierre. have just been... Right. <laughs> you know, you would have say, just accepted the situation and gone, yes, sir, no, sir. Yeah, it's a little three bit. Three bags four. Yeah, well, not, not even that really, because I did that as well. But, you know, I was, it was strange. I think, um, you know, I, I find a, there's a lot of, uh, I don't think pleasure is the right word, but there's a lot of uh, satisfaction, perhaps, if you can give something back to somebody else. You know, even if it's just talking about a piece of work or something like that. I think with Tamburini, I don't think he actually wanted to give that bit back, if you see what I mean, which is a shame right. because he had a lot, really, he was a very talented guy with a lot of um, sensibility more than anything. You know, I'd see, I, he wasn't a designer in the sense of some of these sketches, and as, as Pierre mentioned, he's somebody who just had a really good eye, putting it bluntly, and, had a very, and was very driven to do the best job he could. You know, there wasn't any limits, there wasn't any criteria of timing. If it overran, then it overran as long as it needed to be. And unfortunately, you know, today it's not possible to do that more often than not. But he was very, very lucky to find the support of somebody within his life to allow him to, 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 to basically demonstrate the best job he could 
could achieve regardless of budgets, regardless of timing and the resources. And he did an amazing job. You know, he had a really good eye on him. He was good at copying as well. He was good at taking things from other people as well. You know, taking the ingredients from a lot of different designers or other people, other projects, you know, influenced his work. But he'd do a really good job of assembling all these all these elements together. And that is something that not many people have that ability to to assemble many, many ideas into one cohesive design and that was where Tamburini probably you know more than being a designer he's probably a really good chef you know in some respects you know brings all these ingredients in and brings them together and adds in a very you know he had a very very um yeah he would model in in with a you know uh a kind of angle grinder literally you know he'd be I remember the, the, when I did the when I did the brutale in the first project <laughs> we, we finished the clay and he was like um looking at the tailpiece on it. And this was just before, this a few weeks before I left anyway. But anyway, to put it, to, to cut a long story short, I had this angle grinder and he, and he said, you know, let me, let me do it. Let me do it. So basically there was this fiberglass tailpiece to the bike and he started like just brushing on the surface, taking a bit of, you know, bringing the surface down a bit. And then he'd like, Pull it a bit harder, and basically by the time he finished, there was like a hole in the back of it. There wasn't any surface left because that had to go a lot lower than I and I put it on the, on the clay kind of thing. So this was like his way of designing. It was like you know, it was very much kind of like take it and, and just get it right. Just keep reworking it until it's right kind of thing. It was like there's no limit to to the time scales. But then when I arrived in Benelli, then there was time limits and budgets to. To consider and you know certain you know uh, things the list of, of of timing and 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 the request to get a project done within a certain time frame became much more evident you know in Benelli because I was on my own basically and had to get stuff done in like three months well, I just come away from a company that spent six years to do a motorcycle literally. Six Jesus. years <laughs> compared to three months. So, and I didn't have obviously oh. Tamburini's experience. So, you know, it's all, it was a, a huge learning curve as well. The whole thing was a huge learning curve. And if I didn't, if I wouldn't have gone through RCI, I'd have never been ready for it psychologically, I don't think. Because I'd never be able to, you know, because I, I did the sort of unachievable in RCA. So I knew I could kind of, with the help of a really good team of people in the form of AKA, I could do a really good job in there as well, kind of thing. So, I suppose you've got to believe a little bit in yourself. In the, you know, in did you not feel? Did you not feel burnt out after that experience, though? No. I mean, fr- like go, if, from really. RCA. Oh no? yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. That was a. Uh, you know, it's a bit like um, you got to start again, demonstrating to Tam- Tamburini. Yeah, okay, maybe like some of the sketches and stuff like that, but like you know, to start again on the on the process of you know getting other people on you you know to believe in you kind of thing <laughs> you know had pretty high standards and stuff and so you know you're in at a deep end completely from day one really and you had to you know it was a difficult experience Italy because there wasn't you know it wasn't the course the Italian course and there wasn't I wasn't particularly wealthy uh, I had you know my parents as I say covered a lot of the costs of my RCA, but I went to Italy with like a hundred pounds kind of thing, <laughs> literally. I, I didn't have any money at all. So I was literally, you know, every month was a real struggle, you know, because I wasn't earning a, a really particularly good salary at the beginning of uh, my experience in in uh, in Italy. But, uh, you know, they had basically, another, another thing they, they gave, you know, they lent me a bike to use of thing is transport so I was going through the winter I like <laughs> crashed into the in, you know I, I came off the road about four times in the winter because I was living up in the mountains and uh, unfortunately without the car without a car to use uh, I was using a motorcycle and and so um, uh, occasionally I'd slip off the edge of the road into a dike kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> next to the road Fucking hell. yeah so it wasn't it wasn't an easy it wasn't like a dream you know it was a dream job but in the you know in a context that wasn't particularly dream worthy you know I wasn't living in a in a villa <laughs> you know in the middle of some paradise Italian paradise shall we say so 
Yeah. So what happened? What happened at Benelli? Yeah, Benelli. Uh, well, what happened is, yeah, I turned up there, and as I say, they gave me an opportunity to do to work on their new range of motorcycles, which was really. But no, what? Oh. No, sorry, but uh, but no, but what, why? Why did you end up leaving there? Because uh, I, I um, okay, uh, basically. Primarily, it was only because of one reason. Uh, Benelli was being sold off because the um, the company was in the company was in a uh, began in a, in a kind of it was kind of bizarre. You know, they had the strategy to sell a, a 900cc sports bike alongside a scooter, and there's such an abyss between the two projects that a dealership that sells a scooter isn't necessarily a dealership that sells a, a 900cc. You know, thirty-seven super thousand bike. euro yeah. superbike, and you know it was Jeez. a bizarre kind of business model. And the owner of the company's father, who was basically funding this activity, said, "You know, enough's enough." Putting it bluntly, so we have to sell the company off. So they sold it to uh, a Chinese manufacturer, and I kind of thought, oh, I don't know, I don't know if that's really right for me. I, I've really enjoyed the experience of Benelli. I've had a, an amazing. You know, I worked in the racing team and I, and I did a naked bike for them. But I really didn't feel that it was right for me to carry on under different uh, ownership, if you like. And so I went back to Tamburini. It's like, never go back to an ex-girlfriend. It was never go back to Tamburini. <laughs> but I did. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I went back to Tamburini and basically um, he said, oh, you know, promise me the earth. And again... It didn't last, unfortunately. You know, I stayed to M to, I stayed in MV, but you know, the things that were promised and the things that were said were, weren't necessarily respected. But you know, for some bizarre reason, I I I, I kind of kept hanging on in MV. I felt that it was I don't know. I, were, I it was really bizarre because when I went back, to, I would, I'd been to Benelli, and I'd been away for like three or four three years. I went back to MV and they hadn't done anything new <laughs> since I'd left. And I was thinking it's like three years I've been working on what have they been doing kind of thing. And I'd done, I'd done like two projects, a super bike, uh, stuff like that. It was really bizarre. But uh, I kind of, at the beginning, I kind of believed it would work. And then I sort of hang up, hung on. And, uh, you know, eventually Massimo Tamburini left, left MV uh, when Harley Davidson took the company over, I think he felt a bit under pressure to associate, to align to programs and align to timing plans. You know, he never worked under the real sort of normal, normal kind of criteria within his life. So I think he found it quite difficult to, to kind of a, be obliged to do his work within, you know, prim primarily for me, that was the main reason. I think he was in difficulty to to work within parameters in a way, because he'd never done that within his career. So that was one of the main reasons, I think. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. But he decided that it would be better to to leave uh, MV Augusta. And then I took basically the role of design director from him, you know. So, and I took, I held, held that role for, until I left last year for about 30 Yeah, because you were, in the end, you were there for like 20 odd years or something. Uh, a bit less than that, but yeah. Long, oh yeah, in total, probably about seven, 16 or 17, yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Too long. <laughs> but it was, I mean, Envy Augusta is an incredible brand and I was, you know, I can't, I was really lucky. I think I was, you know, okay, commercially, yeah, Envy Augusta is a very difficult brand to, to, you know, it's very specific. It's a, a small niche brand but I had an amazing amount of freedom to work on everything. I did everything that, you know, I didn't have anybody really saying no to stuff in, in MV. I was really lucky. I think, you know, when you look at a lot of designs that are done by companies, I think less so now, but in the past, there was a lot of filters, you know, marketing and, you know, managers and people, you know, pol politics, basically. And I was really lucky in MV because I didn't have any of that really, and I didn't have a, I didn't really didn't really have a, a big team of designers or anybody. I didn't, you know, I had a um, really small team of designers in a way. I'd have a, you know, there was a, a um, 
a graphic designer and I had a, a, um, another a designer for, for about a couple of years. But basically most of the work, although I was design director, I was design director myself most of the time kind of thing. So, But I was really lucky to... to I, I, I loved every project in MV. It was really, really cool. I mean, I'm really proud of the work I did. And, and I was really proud of the fact that I managed to transition from Tamburini to the work I did. There wasn't, it was almost seamless. There wasn't a big interruption. I didn't go out of my way to, to change the world. I went out of my right. way to, to right. retain what was already there and, and just kind of nurture, you know, it could be seen as, you could be criticized as being unoriginal and, you know, Re, rework and things that already exist but there's also the you know Tamburini has such a high level that it was pretty daunting really to take on that role and I was fortunate because I'd overseen some of the you know his methods and the work and and you know more than more than the actual work itself is just to just aim to do the best basically so I you know I, I've, I've always tried to retain a really high level within everything I, at least like if if i don't believe in what i'm doing at the end of the day why should anybody else do, you know, believe in it kind of thing that's yeah. what i see yeah, yeah 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 and and so design for me isn't necessarily about being necessarily the best designer it's about doing the best you can you can possibly you know achieve within the parameters of the you know the team you, you know the timing all the rest of it so you know if you don't put everything into it I knew that I couldn't do anything better, for example, when I was given the opportunity to do the F3, which is the first bike that I was completely uh, free from any, you know, I worked on the closure of the F4 project, which was the sports bike, the 1000cc sports bike. And then I moved on to the F3 bike, which was the first bike where I was completely alone to demonstrate, you know, what I was capable of doing. Again, this time under Harley Davidson's rule book which meant there was a timing plan and there was meant there was constraints on certain component costs and what have you so the, for the first time you know i didn't have the same rule book unfortunately as, as massimo tamarini but uh i think it was a fairly seamless transition uh in terms of the quality of the work you know and also the bike was a, a lower cost bike as well so it was for me it was a big achievement to to not really be noticed, you know, more than often than not, it was Tamburini was associated with the product that I designed. So that was a kind of big compliment in a way, in some respects. It's a huge compliment. I mean, I, I, um, I, as I, I said to you on the phone before, like I'm not really um, a big bike guy and I don't really know all that much about bikes, but uh, the the F4 specifically, and, and, and I mean, to, I guess the F3, you could put it in that category as well, is just it's a piece of art it's like it's it is like a a ferrari or almost on 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 two wheels mm. and i think that um you know if you if you talk you you mentioned that it's not necessarily being about being the best design about being a best designer but you know it's about doing the best job that you can do within those parameters mm. that is being a good that is being a good designer because being a good designer is managing those things as well yeah. so um I um, it's that is I mean that's that's a it's a huge thing to be proud about. But I um, can you just tell me a little bit about the the F four because I like the I I know for the most part it's a bit like a nine eleven. It hasn't changed that much Man. in that period of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, the F four was. Uh, I mean, the original F four. Was, uh, it was done in like the mid nineties, wasn't yeah, it? The, no, the first I think, one. I think it was, yeah, nineteen ninety six. I think it came out, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, nineteen ninety six, ninety seven, something like that. Anyway, around about that period, early, early or late nineties. Um, yeah, I mean, the project itself was, uh, you know, the first. There was a first version, uh, the you know, which is is a, is a really lovely piece of work and. You know, it was an assembly, again, it was an assembly of many ideas from many designers. A bit of all the designers who were working at um, Royal College, uh, the, uh, the CRC design studio at that point, uh, you know, had a contribution to that. You know, so basically you could see it as a list of people and a list of parts they did, again, with the assembly of, you know, Tamburini. And there was some really, you know, it set the, the he he just, he designed the 916 Ducati, which was a very, 
you know, is is the nine eleven if you like, you know, and now you see it as a as a Panagali or whatever, but there's still the DNA of the nine eleven, uh, the nine eleven, the nine one six within that. Uh, with the F four, Tamburini didn't want to change anything on the F four at all. But at the same time, uh, Castiglione, Claudio Castiglione, who was the owner of the company, did want to make some changes. So I mean, you know, it was it was very limited with the F4. That I, I I worked on the uh, the restyled version, and uh, you would not believe the amount of arguments just to change the exhaust section at the back from r- round to square. Basically, you know, Claudio Castiglione would insist that I keep pushing for these different exhausts because he wanted to differentiate the bike somehow or other, you know, and he wanted the exhaust to be kind of more angular and a bit more aggressive at the back. And, you know, there was things, you know, there was some ergonomic things that changed the proportion of the bike so that, you know, there's more space to sit on the bike because the original F4 is very, very beautiful, but it's very, very limited in terms of using it as a sports bike because there's very little move, you know, space to move backwards on it in a sort of prone position. So, I mean, there was some ergonomic things and we had to change the proportion of the fuel tank and stuff like that. But, it, you know, we changed everything on that bike. Everything, you know, the fuel, you know, the from the headlight. But everything remained the same. You know, it was a 911 in some respects. And it was probably the right thing to do. But, you know, on some, on some obviously, it depends on how you see it. Some people see that as a cop-out. <laughs> in a way and some people see it as a, I, as a I don't, very even I don't. you know it's actually it's very nice when you see the bikes together because you realise how really diff, quite different they are in terms of the treatment of the surfaces but there's obviously some parallels you know there's you know the, the shape of the headlight has got a more you know there's, there's a lot of energy went into the headlight of the new F4 for example and you know and stuff you know the details were, were different and it wasn't you know it was a different era there was a you know there was a gap between the two bikes and it just felt like uh, it was a real struggle it, really, it took forever to do that bike it but was, how did you navigate how did you navigate that tension because you you've got the owner of the company oh, it was terrible it essentially was really, like really what bad. is your because because basically i had you know in some respects the the f4 was was the kind of um not just a project in some respects it was also uh, something very, very deeply associated with uh, with um, Massimo Tamburini. You know, Massimo Tamburini was the design director of MV, and but it was also in a moment very critical uh, because he was on the border of leaving the company if things didn't work out how he wanted them to. In a way, so it was a lot of it went on a little bit beyond just being a project, a problematic project, shall we say? It was a lot of there was a lot of work done and there was a lot of work kind of destroyed as well. You know, it was a real, really psychologically, it was a very, very difficult period within the company. And, uh, and you know, it was a miracle that we managed to get the bike out when we did really, because it was, it was, you know, literally made and then destroyed and then made and then destroyed on numerous occasions, you know. And if there was anything that had anything new to say on it it was almost condoned you know from the outset kind of thing it was very 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 difficult and impossibly difficult as a project but it was a again another learning curve you know you've got to see always you know there's a lot of negativity in something like that but you also have to sort of see the the positive aspect of what it and what you know what you learned from that experience in a way not as just as a designer but as an individual in a way Adrian, if we look at something um, like that, or let's, I mean, let's use the, the F3 and the, and the Brutale, for example. Like, those are two very different design languages. Hmm. And, like, you've got the one that's, like, this purity, this form, like, elegance. And then you've got some, the Brutale, which is, as the name suggests, a very brutal style of design. Yeah, is there one that... It's is there is there one that you favour over the other? It's probably a little bit. It's probably easier to look at a comparison between MV and Benelli because, like Benelli, was a completely different design language in a way, but it felt really kind of appropriate in some respects because I kind of saw Benelli as like a bit Lamborghini, a bit kind of you either like it or you don't really. It doesn't really matter what people think. Whereas, whereas 
MV is a bit like the Ferrari in some respects. Okay, obviously people make a para, uh, you know a comparison with with, uh, with uh, Ducati and uh, and uh, Ferrari, but again, you know Ducati is designed by Tamburini, the ones that really kind of instilled that that kind of comparison, yeah. shall we say? So. I think it's the same with MV as well. That was a bit more traditional in some respects, although we did some pretty radical stuff anyway in, in MV towards the end. I think we did some quite interesting provocations in terms of design. But uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I've been involved in pretty much all the Brutali right up to the last, uh, you know, the last 1,000cc bike. So, and there's been a big transition. You know, I think MV's got a little bit, bit too much towards the end in a way in some respects i think i've reflected on some of the stuff that was done in mv and i think maybe it was too much so it was in some in terms of uh, the level of you know components and, and complications and stuff but uh that comes out of compromise as well you know mv augusta is not a, a ma you know it's not a huge company and it has, has certain restrictions on certain aspects of uh carry over parts and what have you like all companies do so you know in a smaller company you know you, you the freedom is great but sometimes that can go against you a little bit in terms of you know what the company's willing to to pay for in some respects so but i mean you know every uh, i don't know if i've really responded to the, the question in some respects but you know for sure you you you, you know i think the a good, a better comparison is, is some, in some respects, is Benelli and MV. Yeah, Benelli was one thing, okay. and, and, and MV had a different rule book. And I tried to stick to that as much as I could, really. You know, always injecting something a bit new into the equation, but trying to keep some of the values that Tamburini put down initially, some of the foundations, which is, I think, the right I, thing I, to do. De definitely, and I, but I think, like, I mean, if you. I mean, if if we if we were to use MV, in recent times the MV example, like something like the Super Veloce and the new Brutale, I mean, those two things are unmistakably MV, but the design language is still quite different. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the one is the one's pretty restrained, and the other one is quite quite aggressive. Yeah. Is there and and um, I just I wondered if if there's if you enjoy doing both or is there something that you favor over the other? No, I'm, I, I mean, the Super Veloce was a really, like a really cool project it, and it happened really it's quickly. It's a beautiful, beautiful bike. Yeah, I think it's like, particularly the original, the, the, the Serie Auto version, which is like the Gold Series version, which is, you know, the correct coloration and all the details were like exactly like, I I mean, I, I you know, I love MV and I really, I always much preferred MV to be a lot more sober than they are in some respects because you know when we presented like the F3 uh, silver red with some bronze gold detailing that's it you know no there's no graphics on MV you don't need all that stuff all over it and then unfortunately that, <laughs> that isn't always the case with MV and like again when I did you know we worked on the the, the Super Veloce it was Red and silver with some nice gold detailing, and it, it for me that's what MV should be. You know, it can't be because the company can't just sell red and silver bikes, unfortunately. But if it was down to me, they would. <laughs> you know, but unfortunately, it isn't down to me, or wasn't down to me, should I say, past tense. But uh, you know, I kind of, I, I, that for me is what makes it MV. You know, the coloration of a vehicle. The, kind of gives it, particularly with motorcycles, because, you know, every colour has got its association with a brand. You know, you think about Kawasaki as green, like blue is Suzuki, and then you think about Ducati. If you, you know, if I ask what colour is a, you know, a name me a brand that's red, you know, red motorcycle, you don't think of anything else apart from Ducati, really. So the colour is pretty essential to, to, to what the identity of the vehicle is, but also the purity of a red and silver bike really lends itself to like an F3 or a Super Veloce. But then, you know, MV has just taken a slightly different route now where there's a lot of graphics on the bikes. Many, many graphics. Too too many, perhaps. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, even when I was working there, and this is, you know, for some bikes it works, but um, I prefer the kind of purity of, a, you know, what I consider to be a, an MV is red and silver with some nice subtle detailing and very little graphics but if you look at the current range of mv which is you know work that was done when i was there it's a it's not just 
purity, if you like, in terms of graphics and stuff. I, you know, the the the, the temptation, especially with with non designers, is to they they want to see more action in the design in the design language. And the thing is, with a with a a, a, a bike like an MV, or if you were to compare it to cars, for example, you know, the proportion is going to br- bring so much drama to the equation that it doesn't need all this extra shit in the, yeah. um, in, in either the surfacing or the graphics. Yeah, and I'm also very much of the, of the mindset and, and I, you know, I love restraint in, in design. Yeah, restraint know? is it's, hard work though. <laughs> it's a lot harder. I know, it's very, it's a lot no, easier to very, add a few details. I'm the master exactly, of details. Exactly. So. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it's it's like you know this additive design, which I think is something like so, like something like Lamborghini's gone down. Uh, I mean, and it doesn't have to do that, but it's like you know you're constantly adding more shit to to this thing, mm. and you just you know how can you how can you say uh, how can you say this message in three lines, you know, as opposed to yeah. ten? No, I, I get it completely, and I think actually some of the I've been. I've been involved in some interesting projects in this new, you know, since I've become a, you know, since I've left MV, I've worked on some projects that really have made me set, sit back a little bit and actually reconsider what I'm doing every day. Because when you're in a company, there is a bit of a tendency. I think, I don't know, um, I don't know if other people would agree with me who work in the industry, but there is a bit of a, you know, going to work in the morning and it is a bit of a routine. It could be a new project you're working on, but there is this tendency to look in the box of bits. And I'm not just talking about, you know, physically, but like the bo- box yeah, of yeah. bits that's in your head to say, that's where we're going to start from again. You know, if I think about motorcycle design as a whole, to be honest, it's the same rule book and the same ingredients as it was 20 years ago. And now, and now we're in, entering finally a kind of a huge moment of transition within, you know, obviously the automotive, the car industry as a whole, but the motorcycle industry and, and the all, and, you know, dare I say, um, urban mobility, you know, whatever, which could be encompassed two wheel design sort of thing. So for me, I've really, you know, literally is the first time I've sat back and actually reflected a little bit about what, what I'm actually doing every day. And because I've had to do that for, you know, for other projects. And it's been the most interesting kind of period in terms of my design career, because one, I've seen a slightly different, from a slightly different perspective in terms of the projects I'm working on currently. And also I've seen it from a slightly different perspective because I'm forced to rethink what I'm doing every day. And when you're in a company, you do have a tendency to kind of go in the same, you know, in the same, it's a bit like, there's a, there is, you know, control C, control V kind of thing. It's a bit that. You rework stuff. You don't sit back and actually say, why the hell am I doing this thing every day? Why, why am I sketching this this vehicle? Or what context is, is it going to have tomorrow, this vehicle? You know, is it is it going to be the same as, what, you know, the motorcycle industry is completely conservative and we're basically designing motorcycles for a population that's completely moving away you know, the biggest problem with uh, Harley Davidson is the fact that they, you know their clients are dying off basically, and so you know you've got to see things are from a slightly different perspective now because the motorcycle industry has to go somewhere else now. You know, stick, you know, be it the powertrain or be it the the, the person who you're designing it for. So uh, you know, it's been an interesting period since I've since I've left in MV. I've it's been a. Uh, a little, a somewhat different way of looking at things, you know, as a, from a design perspective. And, it, you know, it isn't to say that I'm, I still have the, you know, all the, all the ingredients, all the things are the same as before, but you have to think about it a bit more than when I was in MV. It was a very much, a, you know, I was still working with the same ingredient. You know, I, I designed, you know, in 1995 when I joined uh, CRC, I designed a motorcycle that I had. A trellis frame, a combustion engine, a rear swing arm that was single sided, and you know had a headlight that was either you know a rhomboid or a or a you know a, um, a, an inclined circle. And after twenty five years <laughs> or twenty years, I was doing a motorcycle with a trellis frame, a single sided swing arm, uh, and you know that can't be right. You know if you think about anything else, 
in this world at this current moment, there's nothing that has, hasn't not transitioned, you know, hasn't moved from one area to another within the last 20 years. But motorcycle design has become completely not irrelevant, but it's, it's not moved on at the same speed as perhaps other things in, in, you know, and that's why, you know, we're designing today for a population that is kind of 50, 60, 70, you know, they're that age group is what, you know, all the rule book is appropriate for that age group. But what about the guys who are coming in at 20 years old now in the motorcycle industry? You know, who, what we, what we're going to be aiming for? How do you, how do you sell a, a motorcycle and give it a new context in a way? You know, if you, people, you think about, I mean, it, this is, it's been a bit of an eye opener working on other projects that are related directly to motorcycles as well, because I think there's a huge, huge opportunity, you know, to, to do something that is much more interesting and relevant as well. You know, I think motorcycles have to be kind of, it's a moment to start looking at it in a slightly different, from a slightly different perspective in some respects. What, what opportunities do you see besides just making a two wheeled electric bike? Well, I mean, well, I mean, I think just saying it's electric allows you to do something that isn't necessarily you know, the packaging is going to be different and the, you know, as I say, the context is going to be different, I think. And who you, who you actually appealing to, you know, you, you know, an, an MV Augusta is appealing to a certain type of potential owner, you know, it probably got a bit more money in the bank than, than the average, you know, it's not aiming at sort of a six, 18 year old, this kind of thing. You know, maybe the 18 year old would like to have an emergency cycle, but maybe not, you know, maybe probably more interested in iPhone 13 or something, you know. So how do you capture that? You know, the, the motorcycles for me is always the thing I've loved about motorcycles in my life. It's the most, it's something that I never got bored of as, a, as, a, as an object because the dynamics of riding a motorcycle are very unique and it's a very kind of, you're, you're involved. It's like, you know, people have the same emotion towards cars, but with a motorcycle, it's very much a three dimensional experience in terms of, you know, when you're on the bike, the whole visual, you know, the whole feeling of re riding, uh, uh, a motorcycle is quite unique in terms of the dynamics and and, ha and the satisfaction it gives you being it in the context of a racetrack or be it in the context of going through a you know down a beautiful road in the middle of uh you know a valley or something you know uh, and and for me it would be nice to transmit some of that aspect in a in a completely different new in a newer context you know and it could be something as, as you know, how do you transmit that to somebody who's not interested really in motorcycles in a way, in the in the current form? That's a, that's a huge challenge for the industry now, you know. And the yeah, car, it's, a, it's a massive challenge. And yeah. the car industry is much more on the ball in some respects because they have a bigger resources and uh, probably have a you know they're you know look at the the every every time you you switch on the television now there's a publicity for an electric car. Uh, at least in Italy, I'm sure it's like that in Germany now, but or most of the world, you know, you switch on and there's, you know, you're, you're forced into this new mindset. You know, Tesla's now a cool thing, and I, uh, you know, all these all these emerging uh, brands that are, that are developing vehicles specifically within this new kind of market opportunity. In a way, you know, it's impossible to think of you know brands emerging from nowhere to create really, you know, quite dynamically interesting and technologically advanced vehicles just that emerged out of nowhere, you know, suddenly. And within the motorcycle industry, maybe there's not so many players emerging, but there is there is people who are doing the same thing in the car in the motorcycle industry on a much smaller scale. And if you you know, that when you see a bit of that, it makes you realise that there's a huge opportunity to go beyond what we're doing currently in terms of design, in terms of you know how you see a you know how you perceive a motorcycle is actually and as i say i think this has been the biggest eye opener for me leaving mv is that you know there's quite a big world outside of of of, of mv if in some respects you know there's a there's a huge opportunity to do something i think this is a the best period of my career to do something new within two wheel design shall we say and not just because I've left MV, I think it's, everybody's got the opportunity, if you see what I mean, to do something yeah. different now. We've yeah, ha yeah. We have to, we're obliged to, you know, that we can't carry on. Um, you know, I often think about, you know, uh, 
my, my son races like uh, mini motor motorcycles, little 40cc two strokes. But when, I, when you put that into context of his life, it's completely irrelevant that he's racing around on a 40cc two stroke uh, engine motorcycle. It doesn't fit into anything within his life, you know, in a way. So, I'm, you know, taking that forward, how do you sell a combustion engine motorcycle to a 16 year old these days? It's not so easy, perhaps, as it was 20 years ago. When I right. when I loved you know looking at noisy <laughs> two stroke engines and stuff, so you know you've got to put it into into context. I think there has to there's a it's a huge opportunity I think for the industry and for designers to do so to express something new. And obviously you know we've it's good it's more than just an electric bike. It's more than just putting some electric batteries in a, in a, with a motor. It's it's giving a completely different context. You know actually saying. That something you know, it can go beyond. It can become something else. This vehicle, it, it can be something new, and can have a sense of position within your life that isn't perhaps in this. You know, motorcycles in 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 Europe are leisure products, but in a lot of the world, that you know, they're not leisure products. They're a way to get to you know their their mobility to get around cities to move you know move around cities and 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 go to work on kind of thing. You know, and maybe they're becoming you know, leisure products in some, some emerging countries, you know, so, so, I mean, it's, I think it's a, a very interesting moment for, for motorcycle design because it isn't motorcycle design anymore. It's something else, perhaps. <laughs>